Hey, everybody, it is Drags Mike Petralia back with another episode of the Jungle Roar podcast. Want to welcome in and welcome back Richard Skinner of Local 12. You can follow him and should be following him on Twitter at Local 12 Skinny. Uh, Skinny, it's been a rough week for the Cincinnati Bengals on the field and in terms of their injuries. I think it's been well documented. Jamar Chase. Uh, not going on IR, but he's lost for several weeks with the hip injury, uh, reported that uh, he has a hairline fracture of his hip and a torn labrum. That's bad news. He'll be out probably at least, I think, until the first week of December, the Kansas City Chiefs game. Um, and that, I think, might be a little optimistic, but we'll see. And then Cheeto Awuzie, the best corner in the secondary, going down with a torn ACL in his right knee. Okay, let's get to the first things first, and that is what the Bengals are going to do about their secondary, because if Eli Apple can come back from his hamstring injury, he's the starting corner. Cam Taylor Britt shown you enough to earn the other corner spot? I, I don't know if he's shown any of us enough. And, and you know, when we talked to Lou Anarumo, and you were part of that yesterday too, Mike, you know, he, he I think he was succinct about saying, I mean, look, that first game was like a first preseason game for him because he didn't have preseason. He didn't have the first part of this year because of injury. So I don't know if he's shown enough, but by default, he has to play it. I, I think in the perfect world, and I think you'd agree with this, the hope was as this season progressed, Cam Taylor Ritt would keep getting his feet wet, more wet, more wet, to the point of then you saw enough to go, okay, now, Eli, you're our, four, our fourth corner or our third outside corner sure, in a backup sure. role and Cam can go. Well, now you got to throw Cam in there. I mean, really, there's nobody else. Trey Flowers cannot play outside corner on a regular basis. Amari Cooper clearly proved that in a couple of snaps the other night. He's got a nice role as the tight end stopper when it comes to that. I asked yesterday about could you move Mike Hilton outside, and Luke definitively said, no, he's a slot guy. Jalen Davis is a slot guy. So, yeah, I mean, by default, Cam Taylor Britt's it. And maybe this will be a good thing in the long run just to get him out there. He's going to have to be a starting corner sooner rather than later anyway. Um, now you're just going to have to live with his mistakes and just hopefully they're not glaring. Trial by fire. Um, as you recall, I asked uh, Lou Anarumo about the play he almost made in the first yeah. quarter. Very first drive, the 37-yard reception by Donovan Peoples-Jones. Uh, and it was Cam Taylor Britt almost getting his hand on the ball. Almost, but not. <laughs> and what was it that Lou Anarumo said? He said, that was a great him. teaching moment, yes. Mike. Um, don't ever do that again. Yes. And he, and he was, he actually, the, the way he phrased it was perfect. I mean, he, he, it was, it was well done, but listen, that, 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 that's the part of it too, right? The right. kid thinks he can make a play that he probably made it in Nebraska. You can't make those in the NFL against NFL caliber quarterbacks and NFL caliber wide receivers. They're just too good. And so listen, those are the errors he's going to make. Hopefully right. there's not too many of those. And hopefully that is the teaching moment. As Lou said, don't ever do that again. Hopefully the kid realizes I can't undercut routes like that. I just got to either go make a play on the ball to tip it away or go make the tackle. I can't gamble to undercut unless I've got a clear path. He didn't have a clear path. That, that, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're going to have to live with. Well, and he also didn't have really any help over top. I no, mean, right. That's right. And you have to know that. Yeah. Know your leverage points. No question. Correct. And, you know, I think what this leads to is I think Bengal fans out there, and maybe I'm miscalculating this skinny, but I think Bengal fans are willing to live with those mistakes to get yes. Cam Taylor Britt out there exposed game ready so that he's productive down the road because the Bengals know what is coming. And I think they want to see somebody besides Eli Apple out there. And I don't think Eli Apple's played terribly, but there is this sense that they need new blood in that secondary. Yeah. And that was, again, the perfect world scenario was you could kind of do, do both. You could still let Eli get enough reps to keep his confidence, then get Cam enough reps to kind of build him up because we don't know where the ceiling is for Cam Taylor Britt. It might be Pro Bowl caliber corner for all we know. We kind of know where the ceiling is for Eli Apple. And so now we're not in that perfect world, though. So, yeah, you're, you're going to have to live with, with, with trial by fire now at, at this point. And now you really are on thin ice from an injury perspective. That's that's the scary part at the moment in the secondary. Are you surprised or are you surprised, disappointed, whatever adjective you want to use? that the Bengals didn't make a move at the trade deadline. I'm not, I'm, I expected full well that they were going to just rely a on the waiver wire and B on a guy like Alan George off the practice squad. Yeah. So, so there's twofold to this. I listen, you've made your bed now by doing this. You've certainly exposed yourself to fan criticism. If this doesn't work out right, right. at the same time, the logical part of it is it's, it's multifold. 
number one, there's only one cornerback that got traded at the deadline, and that was William Jackson the third, and you didn't want him back. So yeah. it wasn't like there was a heavy cornerback market out there of guys going to teams. A lot of teams in the playoff hunt. Are they going to give up a, a, a top flight corner, or even their third, fourth, or fifth corner, if they think they're going to be in the playoffs? Of course they're not. So then you go to the dregs of the, of the NFL. And if I'm them and I've got a frontline corner I want to trade, well, hey, you need him bad enough. You better give us some draft capital. We really can't give up draft capital because what's going to happen in the next couple of years, Mike? Joe Burrow's going to get paid. Jamar Chase is probably going to get paid. Right. Uh, well, he's going to get paid. It's just a matter of when. Logan Wilson's going to get paid. T. Higgins is probably going to get paid. The rest of your roster then is going to have to be made up with draft picks. So the draft capital becomes very, very um, needy to keep. You needed to keep that draft capital unless you were wowed by somebody saying, hey, we'll give you the Texans. We'll give you Steven Nelson for a sixth round pick. Sure, I'll take Steven Nelson first. But you got to have trading partners. Maybe they didn't ask for that. Maybe they asked for a second round pick for Steven Nelson. Maybe they didn't even talk about Steven Nelson, but you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. They're just, I, I get why they didn't, but you also now put yourself in that bind of, Hey guys, you didn't do it, and the season went haywire. And why didn't you do something? You put yourself open to that criticism. Are you stunned? I am that the Bengals have no interceptions from their corners. It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it, it, listen, quarterbacks are so much better these days that you don't get a ton of big numbers in interception. You know, back in our day, Mike, you know, corners would have nine, ten, eleven interceptions. That was a, that was the no hell. If you were an average corner, you got five, six, or seven. Right. Um, that part doesn't happen much anymore. But yes, to answer your question, no, no doubt. One thing this defense doesn't do, and I think that's maybe part of the Luana Ruma way, they don't gamble a lot. And that's what you saw the other night. Cam Taylor Britt gambled, and what yeah. happened? It didn't pay <laughs> off very well. The interceptions for them have come on some overthrows where Von Bell's been in the right place at the right time. Von making a couple of good individual plays as well, where he's in the right place at the right time in coverage on deep balls. But yeah, just from a statistical anomaly, you figure you get a tip ball here or there, or somebody throws a bad out route that you're able to jump, and it just hasn't happened yet. Uh Von Bell will never get an easier interception yeah. in his life than the Amari Cooper gift. It was such a bad decision. Oh, my God. And, well, you know, watching that in the press box, I'm like, okay, this is their opportunity. Oh, yeah. Take advantage. And I'm like, it, it was early enough in the game. The Bengals got a break when they uh, when B.J. Hill blocked the, uh, the uh, field goal field attempt. Goal, yeah. And then they get the break on the next drive with the pick. And I'm like, at some point, they've got to capitalize. And that, to me, is one difference I'm seeing between the 2022 Bengals and the 2021 Bengals. They're not as opportunistic. When they get the break, they're not punching the ball in the end zone with you know, decent fields or even on short fields. They've got to do a better job of that in the second half. No question. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and that was, I, I was with you. I thought, okay, the Browns are, are, you know, they come in at two and five. You know, everybody's on them. This is kind of last stand time for them. And in, early in the ball game, as you mentioned, you had three points taken off the board by a block field goal. Then you have a stupid play call, letting Amari Cooper throw a pass. And he makes a terrible decision on top of the stupid play call. And it's almost like the Browns are literally just trying to do themselves in here. But the Bengals didn't take advantage of it. And you're right, especially now when you're down some weapons, you're down a guy in the secondary, every break you get, you better darn well take advantage of it. Yes. Uh, I, before we leave the uh, cornerback discussion here, Dax Hill, I find this to be a fascinating decision as to whether or not the Bengals are going to, uh, are inclined, Lou Anna Rameau and Zach Taylor and Duke Tobin, uh, are inclined to leave him as a safety or expose him more as a corner because he's got the speed and the skills um, to, you know, assume that position even on the short term. Yeah. So our line of questioning, you were part of it to Dax. We all kind of leaned towards believing he was going to play some more outside corner, right? And almost we, were, we felt like we were trying to trend him in that direction. That got tamped down a little bit by Zach Taylor, Lou Anaruma, where they talked about, we'll get him some reps there, but we've got some packages for him. I don't think they really want to do that unless it's a complete necessity, unless you are down in a given. Like they were Monday night. Like they were Monday night. I mean, he got thrown out of there right. literally because he was the last warm body to play the position. Um, I do think they'll rep him more at it. You know, he's not played. He told us he hasn't played what since high school, the outside corner spot. It is, you asked him, you know, the the, the differences in, in the technique and, and where your eyes have to be and all of those things. And it is different. He even talked about, I got to watch film a little differently now. You're watching it from a safety perspective. Now he's got to watch it from an outside corner and a safety perspective. I think they'll rep him there only for emergencies, Mike. I don't think we'll see much Dak Hill at outside corner. Maybe I'm going to be proven wrong. I, I think it's only if if something comes down to one of these guys, Cam Taylor Britt gets hurt, Eli Apple gets hurt, Trey Flowers gets hurt. And right now you are down two of those guys. 
and I don't think they want to flood him with too much Agreed. information Agreed. and too much, too much. Resp- he look, he's proven, I think, to be a very bright, a very versatile athlete, a uh, very exceptional athlete. But I think there is a point that they believe he could reach where too much is too much in a rookie year. Yeah. I, I- I think the fascinating thing to me moving forward is is with that cornerback spot from an injury perspective and or what Luana Rumo may have to do different schematically. For now, it sounded like to me from yesterday when he talked to us was, I think they're going to try to plug and play, do the things that they currently do. And he said, but I can't be stubborn. And so I think that'll be the fascinating thing moving forward to see if, if this doesn't work with Cam Taylor Britt right now or injury occurs where you're plugging some other people in. What does he have to do different schematically? How concerned are you about Joe Mixon? Um, a lot because, um, I didn't think the question I asked yesterday of, of, of evaluate him in all three phases was answered very well by Zach Taylor. I think the follow-up question of, well, how's he doing in pass protection was answered even worse, which tells me that they don't have much faith now, but they're not going to roll him under the bus. Problem is the answer to a question that was later asked about Chris Evans was a very short one. It didn't sound like they have a lot of faith in Chris Evans. Right. So I think they're in that, that mode of, He's still our guy, and we're still going to pump our guy up. But I think they even realize this ain't working right now. So I'm going to throw Chris Evans in this discussion as you well. Should. because Absolutely. I was the one, who, you know, I asked uh, Zach about Chris Evans because he gets in on the first drive, makes a terrific catch on third down on a wheel play uh, over the linebacker. And I'm like, okay, that maybe this is the game where we actually see more of Chris Evans. He disappears. And I'm like, wait a minute. You're desperate to move the ball. You're not moving the ball. You're not getting anything out of Joe Mixon. What am I missing, Skinny? I, I just don't get it. Yeah, the only thing I can do, I, I've talked on my podcast with, with my podcast partner. We talked after the game about the same scenario of, oh, my gosh, he got in for a snap and he made a wide receiver like catch. And it feels like when he gets in and they give him an opportunity – the, the thing I wonder is maybe he's not a great route runner. Mike, we've seen him run the sideline go route. He runs that extremely well. Maybe he's not a great route runner. Maybe in practice, he's a terrible blitz picker upper. But all I know is so is Joe Mixon at the moment. Um, and Chris Evans looks like a legitimate weapon that you've got to find some way to utilize. Does it have to be 52 snaps? No, but it's got to be more than two. So my, my read on that skinny is that they don't trust him to be in the right place at the right time. Agreed. And more- I think that's right. More to the point, Burrow doesn't. If, you know, with the great quarterbacks, quarterbacks is true leaders of their teams and of their offenses. If Burrow calls an audible or calls some type of protection uh, where he needs to be involved, I don't think they trust that. Uh, I, I think that has to be the answer, Mike. I think that has to, that has to exactly be it. Because, I mean, honestly, can the kid run a check down? Can he run a circle route? I'm going to guess he can run those two things. I know when you get him out wide beyond the numbers, he can run a go route. But I think that that has to be it. And that's what it comes down to is, is trust. And I think the answer Zach gave, uh, I think to Ben, you asked a question about it. So did Ben Baby. The one he gave to Ben was very, very short. I think it was almost like, listen, guys, we don't trust him, but I'm not going to say that. You have to read between the lines. And I Correct. think he did, did. Yeah. I mean, Joe Mixon's numbers, Skinny. Oh. The other night, eight carries, 27 yards, 3.6, uh, 3.4 yards average, a six-yard long, meaning his longest carry of the day was six yards. On the season, Skinny, 129 att- rushing attempts, which I believe is fourth most. Fourth in the league, that's correct. Yep. Uh, of running back touches, 432 yards, 3.3 yards uh, per carry two touchdowns the fact that it's the fourth most of any running back in the national football league and he's averaging just 3.3 yards you know at some point it's not the offensive line at some point he's not picking see either he's not seeing the field not seeing the gaps or he's not not hitting them with the same burst not breaking tackles either i mean there's not a lot of yards after contact for him either the one thing i will say mike though is this i mean if you go to the second half of the baltimore game and then you go to to the new orleans game um, and it was a lot of the conversation, right? And even a little bit in the Atlanta game, although they got away from the RPOs just because they were able to sling it around as much as possible. The RPO runs were great. They were not, they, they didn't use them on Monday night. And that, that to me is almost like you had a nice formula going for the entire offense and you That's kind of went, eh, we're going with it. Now, maybe they go back to it. And maybe we do find Joe Mixon again starting to excel because he excelled in it. Yeah, when they went to the gun and went to RPOs over the last two and a half quarters against Baltimore, he averaged six yards a pop. I think he was eight. I'm doing this off the top of my head. I think he was eight for 46 in the New Orleans game, which is over five yards a pop there out of the RPOs. 
Go back to that. At least your running game was somewhat effective, and the passing game was effective, and the protection was better. Well, and the other thing, Skinny, and I'll bring this up because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Sometimes you can be a jack of all trades as an uh, offense collectively. And there has been a lot of credit given to Zach Taylor and to Brian Callahan for being able to mix and match from different offensive schemes around the league. And, you know, we can throw it together on the fly for this, a game planning offense, right. but I don't think they know what their identity is. That's okay. just it. I think that's the exact answer is, and we, that question got asked again yesterday. I think we asked that question. It feels like every week, what do you think your offensive identity is? And I don't think they have one. I thought for, for us after coming out of the new Orleans game, it was the RPOs. I get why they slung it around against Atlanta. That secondary was decimated. Joe was on point. All the things were, that, that's fine. If that stuff is working, then great. You did a smart job to stick with just letting him sling it around all day. That was fine. But go back to the RPOs as your base of your offense. It was working for everyone. The run game for Joe Mixon. It got Tyler Boyd involved more in the middle of the field. It spread the ball around. Look at the targets for T and Chase and, and, and him in those spans. They were all mixed around. Now, obviously, Chase is out of the mix. But I, I just it felt like that was going to be your offensive identity moving forward. And just as quickly as it worked, you abandoned it. Well, and, and this has to fall uh, on the next subject I wanted to touch on real quick, the coaching. It's not been up to par in, in my estimation Fair. and the game planning. On the offensive we, side. On the offense. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. The offensive side. It seems as though we keep hearing it takes them a quarter to figure things out. At some point, it, it can't be like that. And Correct. against, in, in the games, we've seen some uh, modicum of success, certainly against the Atlanta Falcons when they jumped out 21 nothing. We saw that. We saw that in, in the win over the Miami Dolphins. And then, you know, before that, over the Jets, there were much better starts. But that's it. Those three games, yeah. and they have not shown anything offensively in the first quarter. And that is a troubling trend. Yeah, I mean, is that script related? Is that, again, you're, you're taking too long for the feel-out process? I, I go back to this. If you've got these weapons, and yes, you are down one right now, but I guarantee you there's a lot of coordinators around this league, Mike, that would take the weapons you still have. I, I know I joke about you covering the New England Patriots, and you bring it up a lot, but I, but I will say you were around Tom Brady when he didn't have weapons and still made things work. And, you, here's, you know, and here was the key to that, Skinny. He took check downs. He took what he had in front yes. of him. And, and then, Joe started to do that in the RPO game, I thought. That's what I thought. But then, you know, last week it looked like it, it looked appeared to me, Skinny, that that tip pass by yes. Miles Garrett on freaked the him RPO. Out. Freaked him out. Freaked him out. And, OK, we're not going to do RPO. Why? He made a great play. I mean, Miles Garrett's going to make great plays. Yes. And, you know. You know, this argument that when the Bengals face great defensive players, they crumble. I don't buy that because they've beaten great defenses before. They've beaten teams with great players before. And it's a matter of, okay, the guy made a great play against the Steelers. TJ Watt made that ridiculous interception, yeah, interception against yeah. Burrow in, yep. in, you know, in early in that game. But the Bengals still found a way to come back and make plays against that defense. The Bengals just seem like to me something goes wrong and they crumble. And that's not the mark of a winner. No. And I go back, you know, part of it too is this team in offense has the talent to dictate to defenses. And it's almost as if they feel like we got to let them dictate to us so we can re dictate back to them. No, man, go do what you do. Whatever that identity is, make that your identity, make that your base and go do it constantly. Go do it time and time and time again. Until then, a defense reacts, and then you can re-react to that. It feels like they are more reactionary than they are um, dictating to other teams their terms. Speaking with Richard Skinner, Skinny of uh, Local 12. You can follow him on Twitter, at Local 12 Skinny. Um, Skinny, I don't think the team's mentally tough enough. I do. See, I, I, I do, because I, 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 I've seen them come back from the 0-2 start this year. Um, I saw them come back from the disaster in Chicago last year. I, I saw them come back from five and four at the bye last year, losing two bad games. I saw them go to New Orleans at two and three and, and get a big come from behind victory. So I do think they're mentally tough. I, I, 
I think a lot of it is, again, I go back to the whole schematics, play calling, those things. They've got to be better. And that falls on the coaching staff, as you just mentioned. So I guess, let me clarify. Okay. I do think they have the mental aptitude to come back in games. I don't think they exert their will enough. In no, I, in, I think that part's true. I, I'll agree with that. that. That is what I'm getting at yeah. more than they don't have the mental wherewithal to hang in games. I think aside from Monday night aside, okay, throw that game out. In the six previous games, we've cert- or seven previous games. Other than cert- Atlanta. Atlanta. Atlanta, they dictated. They came out and said, okay, you're going to show us this look. We're going to bomb you down the field, and you're not good enough in the secondary. We're just going to throw it all over the lot. And they, they that, that, that was great. In those seven games, those seven previous games, they showed glimpses of not uh, of being able to exert their will. We're going to do what we want to do when we want to do it. Um, It just so happened in the Atlanta game. They did it really from the outset and put the game away. I want to see that against Carolina, but I do have a feeling Carolina's defense is no joke and they have eggs rushers and it's going to be difficult for the Bengals to get out to a fast start, but I do think they need to get out to a fast start. No question. I, the podcast, my weekly podcast that I just got done doing before I, I jumped on with you, um, my podcast partner asked me a question of, are the Bengals the team that has that is, that is struggled in, in the Pittsburgh game and the Dallas game and this last game and, and whatnot, or is it the team that that got off to the fast start against the Jets, that, that won in New York, that, that beat a good Miami team, right. that showed things against Atlanta. And I said, you know what? This is going to be a cop-out. I don't know which team this is. And, and maybe that's the problem. Uh, I'm going to ask you one more question. And it's about a guy that um, certainly will be, I think, regarded as one of the best Bengals in history, especially on special teams. But he's struggling right now. Kevin Huber. Yeah. His numbers on Monday night were not good. Four punts, 36.8 yards average, a net of 34, and he had one of those four inside the 20. The 23-yarder <laughs> in the first, the first quarter, of the night. Yeah. that was bad. Yeah. Um, are, are we seeing the end of the Kevin Huber era, and could we see Drew Chrisman after the bye? Yeah, I, I suggested this uh, yesterday. I did a segment with Mo Egger, and Mo asked me the same thing. And I'm actually going to write kind of like ten questions on the website, ten questions that Bengals fans are wondering. This is one of them, so it, it, it's my personal take on this. I, I talked to somebody in the locker room yesterday, and, and we were just shooting the bull. I said, you know, and this person brought it to me. It wouldn't be far fetched to see Drew Crispin be a, maybe a, a practice squad elevation this week. Let him get his feet wet punting the football in Paul Brown Stadium. Um, and if it doesn't go right, you still have Kevin Huber on the roster at that point, then you make your decision. But if you do let Kevin punt this week, if it doesn't go well, I can't imagine that after the bye, you don't turn to Drew Christman. I think for me, I'd let him get his feet wet at home first. If I'm about to make this move, let him get comfortable. You remember, Mike, I think you saw it. We, a bunch of us saw it before the Atlanta game. They brought Drew out in full uniform before the game to yes. punt. And it was almost like a dress rehearsal of just getting used to the environment in uniform helmet. I mean, it, it was, it was, it was, you know, there was no rush involved, but it was almost like they were trying to get a dress rehearsal for him. I think I'd rather, if I'm going to make this move after the buy Mike, just my own personal opinion, I let him get his feet wet this week before you have to go punt in Pittsburgh, maybe in crappy weather conditions for all I know. Right. I think that's fair. Well, anything else on your mind, anything that uh, Bengal fans should be looking out for on local 12. Yeah. Kind of the stuff we touched on. I did a big piece on, on the cornerback situation, kind of why they didn't make a trade, but you know, with Luana Rumo's thoughts on, on playing, playing younger players, all that stuff that's up there right now, as I mentioned, I'm going to do, it's funny about all these questions you asked me, or I think all the ones I jotted down of here, here are some lingering Bengal. I don't usually do these things, but here are like eight to 10 lingering Bengals questions that need answers. Uh, there you go. Yeah, no, right. Exactly. And, and I think, yeah, I think we're all on the same wavelength with a lot of this stuff. And, uh, that's what makes the Carolina games paramount. I mean, listen, this this is probably too optimistic, I guess. But when you look, it was ugly at the bye last year, right? Yes, Five and four, two ugly losses, one of those to Cleveland. Um, if you can win this game, you're still five and four at the bye. Maybe the division's gotten much tougher because you're zero and three. But you do have, and again, I'm going to give a little, little little sunshine here. I'm not Mr. Sunshine, as you know, usually, Mike. I'm Mr. Cynical, and I always feel like I'm a realist. But anyway, I, I mean, think you, you are. You do have those tiebreaker wins potentially over the Jets in Miami if it comes to the wild card. I mean, those could actually be huge wins when push comes to shove down the stretch. So this is still maybe not going to be the division winning team, 
but it still has a great chance to make the playoffs. And especially then, hey, listen, if Chase gets back for, for Kansas City, as you mentioned, or I think their optimistic view of it because they didn't put him on IR is possibly Tennessee. That's probably pushing it, to be quite frank. But I think that's why they didn't put him on IR. They're kind of rolling the dice, hoping he can maybe get back for that game. Um, then maybe you got all hands on deck other than Chidobi Awuja. And if you're going to tell me that in the NFL, you might have 21 of your 22 starters on the field from week one, still playing in week 10 or 11, um, not many teams have that luxury. Agreed. And that's why I think the whole storyline of, you know, the Bengals didn't have any injuries last year, but they've had them this year. Every team has injuries yeah, every single year. And I do think there's hope for this Bengal team, but I, I there are things that I want to see even in a win. Yes. I want to see them dominate like they did against the Atlanta Falcons. Caroline is two and six, right? For a reason. Uh, two and five. Two and five for a yeah. reason. They're two and oh, no, five. Two and no, you're right. Two and six. They are two and six. Yeah, See, sorry. Jesus. I'm sorry. You know, you, I invite you on my I podcast. And I mess up your numbers. I'm sorry. Anyway, they are two and six for a reason. Yes. Right. And the Bengals have to come out home turf, desperate going into the bye for when they have to act desperate and play desperate and play well. And I think they're capable of doing that. I do too. And um, real quick, you're doing a high school football game on Friday. I am. I've got a little bit on uh, on ESP Media. I've got in the ECC Sports Network. It'll be Winton Woods hosting Ross in the second round of the playoffs. Winton Woods undefeated. Wow. Ross is an interesting team, Mike. They uh, they don't throw it very much. I think they've thrown it 44 times all season long. So really? they'll try to ground and pound you. Well, they, they had really good teams in Division Three the last couple of years. They're in Division Two now. I, I believe two years ago they got to the regional final, if I'm not mistaken. And I think they threw less than 10 passes all year. Oh. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, have fun on Friday night. Cool. People, be sure to tune in ESP Sports and for the one and only Richard Skinner uh, for that Ross at Winton Witten Woods, right? It's yep, at Winton Woods. Yep. It'll be a barn burner, I'm sure. I love high school football playoffs. It's just uh, one of the best times in Ohio sports all year long. He is Richard Skinner of Local 12 Sports. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at local 12 skinny and be sure to head on over to local 12 uh, com. what is the official website so i don't screw it you up got it. You, you nailed it local 12.com local 12 .com. Use the number, use the 12. don't spell out 12 it's the number 12 local 12 yeah. .com. local 12 one two that would be and uh, be sure to check out all of his great bengals coverage he is richard skinner i'm mike petralia until next week thanks for watching